Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. Last time we revisited the struct stat with a focus on the A time, M time and C time members. We noticed that things involving time can get a little confusing, but to be honest, there was nothing compared to what we'll see in this video. Time is weird as a concept by itself, but our feeble attempts to make sense of our position in the universe and then to convince computers to play ball can lead to some entertaining surprises. But first, where does time come from? Well, as far as Unix is concerned, the kernel keeps track of time and provides it to any process asking for it, based on counting quartz crystal oscillations or some such. That sounds complicated, so let's just gloss over that. Anyway, as we mentioned in our introductory session, Unix keeps track of time as seconds elapsed since the epoch, midnight on January 1st, 1970. You can get this count back as an abstract data type time t by calling the time function. We've already talked about the problem of wrapping a 32-bit counter to represent this data type, leading to planes falling out of the sky and whatnot on January 19th, 2038, so we can gloss over that as well. Nice. Okay, here's the code. Simple function, simple example. Call time, print out the time t, which conveniently converts into a long int, et voila, you get a standard Unix timestamp of the current time as seconds since the epoch. But wait, time is a library function, not a system call, right? So where does time itself actually get the time from? Easy enough to find out, use the source. Here we have the implementation of the time function in libc, and it looks like all it does is call get time of day. Here's what that sys call looks like. Like before, we get back what the system thinks the current time is as seconds and microseconds elapsed since the epoch. The time val struct has two fields, and the second argument, the struct time zone, is only provided for source compatibility and is ignored or set to zero by get time of day. Sounds great, let's give it a try. Here we add to our previous program a call to get time of day and print out the results. As seen in the output here, the tvsec field is the same as the time t, time returned, but now we see microsecond granularity via the tvusec field. But let's go back to the fact that the second field passed to get time of day is being ignored. That seems odd, doesn't it? And also consider we've seen that some Unix versions provide, for example, the various time fields in the struct stat with even finer granularity than microseconds, namely in nanoseconds. How do we get those? Okay, so here we have the clock get time system call, which, not at all coincidentally, is what POSIX says one should use instead of get time of day. With this call, we pass in the struct time spec that the syscall fills in for us. This function then provides seconds and nanoseconds since, yes, of course, the epoch. Let's add a call to clock get time to our program. The output here looks good. We even see an increase in microseconds between the call to get time of day and clock get time. So now we know how to get accurate time, stored in the struct time spec, a struct time well, or a time t, each giving us seconds since the epoch with increasing granularity. Alright, so seconds since the epoch. Typical Unix timestamp. Awesome. But I'm not a computer. I'm a human. And as a human, I'd much prefer a more readable date, since I don't like to count seconds since January 1st, 1970. So how do I turn a time t into a human readable date? First, we have to break down the time t into another data structure, a struct tm. For that, we use the gm time library function. The gm time function converts the time t to a coordinated universal time, aka UTC. And the fact that coordinated universal time is abbreviated as UTC really tells you all you need to know about how much sense computers make of time. The reason for this misnomer is, of course, that English-speaking countries wanted to use CUT for coordinated universal time, while French-speaking countries wanted to use temps universel coordonné, which would be TUC. So everybody agreed it should make no sense at all and be called UTC instead. A successful compromise is when neither party is happy. Anyway, let's take a look at what this struct TM looks like. 
we get fields for seconds, minutes, hours, day of month, month, year, etc. etc. But look at the comments. You'll quickly find a few quirky things here. For starters, we have the year being represented as a number of years since 1900, not since uh, the year zero or whatever. So while this is not exactly a Y2K remnant, it can easily lead to a Y2K issue. Wait, do any of y'all even remember Y2K? Well, look it up. Next, note that we count days from 0 to 365, which adds up to 366 days. Alright, that's not so crazy. We have leap days after all. Every four years or so, we get an extra day, and all of a sudden February has 29 days, and your calendar app you coded up fails in surprising ways. But leap years are not the only thing. We also have something called a leap second, and this is where things get a bit complicated. We use the defined seconds as derived from, effectively, how our planet moves around the little bit of space we could observe, notably that big yellow ball of fire in the sky. But then we change the definition to be derived from the electron transition frequency of cesium atoms. But this time, standardized as International Atomic Time, or TAI, this time from the French name Tombs Atomique Internationale, is not always in sync with how our planet bobs through space, so every so often we have to add or remove a second to make the two match. These discrepancies are observed by the International Earth Rotation and Reference System, which announces them to the public. So you can subscribe to the announcement mailing list, and then every six months you will get one of the coolest emails ever. An email from the International Earth Rotation and Reference System to the authorities responsible for the measurement and distribution of time, telling you whether or not six months later a second will be added or removed. Here we see the email from the last time a leap second was added, in 2016, and the mail on the right from July noting that this December we will not add a leap second. To date, we've had 27 leap seconds, since they were introduced as a concept in 1972. But as fascinating as all that is, having leap seconds adds all sorts of headaches. For starters, POSIX says that seconds since the epoch monotonically increase, and that implementations do not need to account for leap seconds, and so we get various problems when parsing or converting such dates. Here we see the Unix timestamp that translates to December 31st, 2016. 235958 translates correctly, and so does 235959. But 235960, the leap second, parses as midnight, January 1st, 2017. And the other way around doesn't work well either. The leap second time parses as the same epoch timestamp as a second later. And then notice that our struct tm has values going up to 61, meaning there are 62 valid values. But other Unix systems only allow up to 61 values. That is because there's a possibility of a double leap second, even though we've not seen one so far. Or rather, there appears to have been some discussion about the possibility of a double leap second, and different Unix systems interpreted these decisions differently. And all of that doesn't even account for the possibility of a negative leap second, whereby our cute idea of monotonically increasing time gets completely ruined. As I said, time is weird. But alright, we know how to break down a time t into a struct tm, but we still haven't seen how we can format this struct tm into this convenient date string. For that, we have the ASC time function which takes a struct tm and formats it into a string like this. So we can extend our program from before, and we then finally get the output of the timestamp formatted in a human-readable date. But once we're in the business of representing time as strings suitable for human consumption, we're entering another world of confusion. Let's take another look at our struct tm. There was one additional field is DST, indicating whether or not daylight savings time is in effect. In fact, there may be further flags, not specified by POSIX in the struct TM, that also concern themselves with this concept of daylight saving time, as well as the local time zone, since, as it turns out, not all people around the world are located in Greenwich, England, or anywhere else along the zero meridian. So we probably want to be able to display time in a local time zone. 
for that, we have the local time function. Just like gm time, it breaks the time t into a struct tm, but unlike gm time, local time accounts for the local time zone offset and possible DST. Let's add this call to our program. Hmm, there doesn't seem too much of a difference here. Why is that? Well, our system is not configured to use a specific time zone, and so, like any reasonable production system, operates in UTC by default. But fortunately, local time is smart enough to honor the TZ environment variable, and so we can set a time zone to use by specifying, for example, US Eastern, in which case we do get the current 4-hour time difference to UTC. Time zones, by the way, are completely nuts and an endless headache for software engineers everywhere. Here, have a look at a map displaying the current time zones across the world. Take some time later on to zoom in and look at how the boundaries run. Oftentimes, they are nearly or completely arbitrary of the actual observed solar time and instead drawn based on political borders. And while most are reasonably easy to juggle one hour increments of the zero meridian, every now and then you encounter half hour increments. But where things go really wild is in Antarctica. There, time zones are assigned more or less based on which country owns and operates the research station in a given region. So the Troll research station is operated by Norway, and so it operates in UTC plus 2, except during summer, when it's on daylight savings time and runs in UTC. And that's when it's actually winter in the southern hemisphere, and trying to save any daylight in Antarctica really is not a concept that makes a whole lot of sense. Of course, this is done to simply keep communications easier with researchers in Norway on the other side of the globe, but it gives you an idea how silly time can become. Daylight savings time itself is all sorts of ridiculous too. First of all, most of the countries in the world don't even have this concept. Then there are parts in some countries that do use daylight, daylight savings times that don't. And then there's the fact that this changes all the time. Different countries make decisions around when to start and end daylight savings time with surprising frequency. For example, the US changed the dates on when we switched on and off DST back in 2007. Europe just voted to get rid of DST altogether starting next year, and so on and so on. So if you want to know how to format time in a manner that honors the time zone and the local daylight saving time rules, you need to know what those rules are and keep them up to date. This is a many-to-many -many mapping, as shown here. This is an illustration of all the time zone data you need to have to manage time for our silly humans who don't want to simply count seconds since January 1st, 1970. Your Unix system has information stored under user share zone info. This data is provided to you by the operating system, but obviously we all need to agree on that data across operating systems. And so this data is managed by IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, and yes, you actually do need to keep this data up to date on a regular basis. If you want to check what time it is in a given location, you can run through all the available zones like this. Ok, next let's take a look at how we can manage time that's not the current time. For that we can create our own struct tm, set the various fields as we like, and then call make time, and we get back a time t. That is, make time operates in the inverse direction from gm time local time. And if we have a time t instead of a struct tm, we can use c times instead of asc time to print it. Here, yeah, let's add code to print the date at the epoch. Easy enough. But humans are silly. Did I mention that? Sometimes they have different ideas about how they would like dates to be represented, and it's not the format c time spits out. Here, the date command gives output in this format. And we can ask it to use a different format. This format, by the way, is terrible, because in some countries the first field represents the day and the second one the month, while in others it's the other way around. Which is why the only sane human readable time zone format is this, ISO 8601, where date and time are monotonically increasing and the time zone information is added at the end. But since we're not being ridiculous, we don't even use a time zone and instead use Zulu time, which, seriously, stands for UTC. Zulu time just sounds a lot cooler. Anyway, so if we want to format a struct tm based on the format specified as shown here in the date command, then we use strf time. In practice, it looks like so. 
We avoid magic numbers and define our buffer length as a meaningful named constant. We fill that buffer via strf time. Et voila, get our epoch struct tm in human readable format. All right, I think we've had just about enough with converting time between the different formats. Here's this entire lecture in a single graphic. Yes, I could have just showed you this picture at the beginning and said, well, that's about it. But that wouldn't have been quite as much fun now, would it? So, the kernel provides you a time t, which you can break down into a struct tm via gm time or local time. We can convert a struct tm into a time t via make time. And we can convert these into human-friendly strings via c time, asc time, or strf time. Other than that, we note that time is largely an illusion. Computers struggle with representing it, but most problems derive from humans having different ideas about what it is or should be. Which means that programming anything that handles time in any way, shape or form is likely to hide a number of surprising bugs. Check out the link to the Falsehoods Programmers Believe About Time in the lecture slides. It's both entertaining and quite impressive. This discussion also serves as a reminder that all programming touches or is influenced by geopolitical events in often unobvious ways. And with that, let's call it time for today. Thanks for watching. Cheers.